Horn of Africa. So we're in between of uh, discussions at the moment. So why don't I take you guys into the show floor?
Show the, oh, here we go. You got your Cocoa 3 yet? <laughs> so it's trained all the way. So what is that? This is the uh, new Joypad adapter. So it allows you to run uh, Sega Genesis joysticks on your Cocoa 3. Or other style of joysticks as well. But it has to be the, uh, the anything with the Atari uh, DB9 style of ports. It's around now, I guess. Between taxes and football tickets and whatever, I need to come up with like $10,000. So, 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 so in the in Verilog, you have basically flip-flops. And so, uh, RAM, basically, is the best way to describe it. So, and I remember you can create a RAM, a bit of RAM. Oh, hey, hi. I don't recognize you. Pac-Man. And have pack You don't look like you're black and white. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? I said that's the ultimate selfie machine. Set that, that, that up, stand back. Stand back. You don't need a stick. Oh, uh, cocoa pie. Mm -hmm. Hello. How are you liking? <laughs> All right, let's go back to the uh, show the discussion forum and see see what's going on there. Is that okay? Sure, that's fine. It's actually live streaming. Oh, okay. Wow, even scarier. I'm Ele interested in seeing how I did later. <laughs> eleven people. What's that? Eleven people. Eleven. Oh, wow. All eleven. Huh? And you have multiple cameras on you, so you don't get nervous. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So, if you, all you guys with cameras, are you ready? <laughs> okay. All right. So, uh, hi, my name is, I guess I should introduce myself for the vast majority of you that uh, don't know me. My name is uh, Brennan Donahue. Um, I'm from Austin, Texas. And um, so uh, a little bit of background about me. I uh, initially had an Apple II Plus growing up. <coughs> so... Uh, So I initially had an Apple II Plus. Dad brought that home in the early 80s. And um, that wasn't maybe a year or two later. I, I realized the error of my ways and <clears throat> missed having a, a computer in my uh, bedroom. So, uh, so the, he, uh, he helped me get a, a Coco II. And uh, um, you know, John was talking about you know, having a, a mentor in your life. That was, that was Dad. Because when we first brought home that, uh, that Coco II, 
Um, you know, the box said 64K extended color basic. I didn't mean anything to me. We, we hooked it up and dad said, now the, the screen says color basic and print mem says you have too much, too little memory. So we went right back to Radio Shack and, and brought home a, you know, the right Coco 2. So, uh, so that, that, that was dad, you know, he helped me get started with basic and, and uh, machine coding and stuff like that. So anyway, so uh, I'm here today to talk about um, uh, Coco VGA, which is a, um, um, which is a, a, a simple project intended for uh, the 6847-based uh, machines. So, um, so I'll, I'll go through that in a little bit more detail. Um, I had an introduction. Uh, I'll talk about the history of the project because um, unbeknownst probably to most folks, this actually has been going on, unfortunately, for, for five years in my infinite spare time. Um, current status, and uh, then I'll get into some technical de details for, for those that are interested. So this, uh, this project was actually inspired by uh, Matthew Haggerty's F18A project. So for those of you guys who don't know, that's um, a TI-994A um, video chip. So it just so happens that's also the one that's using the ColecoVision. Um, so he actually has a uh, direct replacement for the uh, TMS-9918A uh, video display processor. And, um, and he sells that and it, it does, it's, it's an awesome chip, it's great. Um, but I always felt like, you know, uh, younger, <laughs> I would just get hypnotized by the by the uh, you know the the poor video quality the you know the the uh, um, just the, the waves of interference on my uh, on my TV and stuff like that on my Coco too and I always felt like it needed something better um, you know composite is a huge step and uh, you know with with the availability of that that things have improved significantly but uh, you know even composite uh, you know monitors with composite are getting a little bit more more and more and more rare so. Um, uh, so the, the goal of this project is actually to enable 6847-based uh, systems, including the COCO 1 and 2, MC10, and Tano Dragon output uh, VGA. <coughs> so here's a, a, a picture of my messy bench with the uh, early prototype. I actually have that one at my, my table. Um, so uh, when uh, Steve Spiller, who's a friend of mine in uh, Washington State, and I started this in uh, 2011, um, you know, it was originally in plan, it planned to be a 6847 replacement. We had a little bit of trouble with the, uh, the timing and uh, switched to snooping. So, um, meaning that uh, the 6847 has to be in place and then we look at the, uh, the digital signals going in and out of the uh, 6847. We don't, we don't mess with the analog signals. Um, so, uh, and, and this, like I said, this picture is uh, an early board. This is a Xilinx Spartan 3E with a, a Digilent uh, board and then uh, the PERF board here uh, just has uh, level shifters on it. So there's the, there's the purchase board with a VGA connector, um, a breakout board, a PERF board with level shifters, and then it's basically piggybacked on top of the 6847 and the Coco 2. Um, so, you know, there, there were some other, you know, I, I would still like to at some point um, do a replacement as opposed to snooping. I think now that I understand the 6847 a little more, I think that will be possible at some point. Um, but there are some advantages to doing the snooping because um, when, you, when you do that, well, the 6847 can still output analog video that can go to the modulator or a composite board, and then you can actually display on both a VGA monitor and you know, a composite uh, monitor or TV at the same time. Um, let's see here. And uh, you know, so so like I said, this is an early prototype that we actually dealt with for a couple of years. But you know, it's pretty obvious that there's you know, what, a couple feet worth of worth of traces and ribbon cable there, um, that you know, with video and uh, um, you know, even a couple megahertz, it doesn't doesn't play so well. Yeah. So uh, last year, I um, I contacted Ed Snyder, um, and you know, kind of showed him what, what we had going so far, and uh, he was willing to work with me on, on putting together a board. So, um, uh, you know, so the idea was, of course, to improve the, the signal integrity. Uh, he also talked me into moving to uh, an Altera Cyclone 4E. Um, but anyway, this is, the, this is the VGA board right here. You can actually come by my table and, uh, and check it out. Um, so normally, you'd see a, um, the, the monitor 
modulator can here. It just so happens that I also have his composite uh, board installed here. Okay, so where we are today. Um, so, so right now, um, you know, the alphanumerics in uh, Cinegraphics 4, uh, switching between the, uh, the Coco 2 and Coco 3 font sets, that uh, works fine. The, um, uh, you know, mo the most common graphic modes, including ar artifacting, work fine. I basically have to emulate the artifacting. Um, so there are some enhancements uh, that I threw in there so far. Uh, being able to, you know, switch artifact colors. You know, I don't know if anybody else is tired of hitting reset until they, you know, get <laughs> get the uh, 6847 on the right edge of the clock. You know, so be able to switch back and forth between uh, between those, um, you know, uh, double wide um, pixels, right? Because, you know, the way artifacting works is it it's basically the, the highest resolution monochrome mode is either, you know, on off or off on, and those give you the red and blue. Well, so you can you can get the the you know, vertical lines out of that, or you can make them double wide, and, and then you basically get half the resolution select between that, um, or you can disable it and basically make it monochrome. So RG6 is monochrome black and white uh, at, the, at the highest resolution the Coco can output. Um, and then uh, reverse video, in case you're getting tired of the, the green background, uh, turn on and off the border. I think another enhancement that uh, Ed asked me for was, was adding scan lines, so that's in there as well. That was, that was pretty straightforward. Um, so let's see here. And then I still have a quite a laundry list of, of to do's. Um, so, you know, some of the long cycle modes, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, what, a, what a long cycle mode and a short cycle mode is with respect to 6847 here, and not too long, uh, aren't, aren't supported yet. So these are some of the intermediate uh, high res graphics modes, um, monochrome especially. Um, there's some video quality issues on some VGA monitors. I did a mini plug test last week, and discovered that not all monitors are quite happy with the video signal yet, so I still got some work to do there. Um, I still need to test SV6, SV12, and SV24. I suspect that once SV6 is working, that the other ones will just fall out. Um, you know, because that's really, th those really come from the SAM, uh, more so than, than uh, an extra mode of the 6847. Uh, today, we don't have uh, 6847 T1 compatibility. I think uh, Ed will probably have to make a, um, a different board just because of the pinout difference. Um, you know, the other the other major difference is that the uh, the latch that's normally on the, the older systems uh, is outside the 6847. So when they pulled that in um, and, and and added lowercase to the T1, right? Um, now now it works a little bit different. Uh, and then uh, production boards. So right now I think there's there's only two prototype boards in existence. Ed has one. I have one. Uh, Ed has already put together some production boards for the original 6847. Um, I don't know if he has them populated yet. Um, I haven't. I haven't actually gotten one in my hands yet, but uh, that will uh, hopefully come soon. So, yeah, some of the some of the challenges that we've kind of run into along the way um, are, you know, variations in single timing based on the clock edge use or the uh, power up. Uh, uh, clock edge used by the 6847, right? This this affects the artifact colors and uh, and things like that. Um, so so the way I deal with that is by actually running the uh, the FPGA at a much higher clock frequency and actually sampling both edges of the clock and actually producing a pulse on both the positive and negative edge of the uh, of the uh, 6847 clock. Um, there are variations in the signal timing. You know, depending whether we're doing long cycle or short cycle, so I've got to resolve that. And then, uh, up until I think uh, two weeks ago, I, I obviously had a misunderstanding about how the SAM interacted with the 6847, and I'll I'll talk about that particular bug just a little bit more here in uh, in just a second. So, uh, so this is kind of the start of, of getting into more of the technical details. Um, so, I'm talk a little bit about the differences between uh, VGA um, and uh, and the Coco style NTSC. Um, so you know, the pixel clock is considerably slower. You would say, well, gee, why can't I just use a uh, line doubler? You know, because well, you got 60 kilos per second, 60 hertz refresh rate for 60, 640 by 480 VGA. Well, what? just line double it. Well, it's not really that simple. Um, and, and part of that is kind of related to the, uh, the pixel clock. Um, so anyway, the uh, basically the half of the, the uh, FPGA is running at the 
this frequency and dealing with sampling with this information, and half of it is running at the VGA output frequency. So um, what I did to try to preserve the, uh, the black border is uh, you know, take in the, uh, you know, basically double the pixels in each direction. So we get a 512 within 640 and 384 in, inside of 480. And that, you know, the visible, you know, green field typically, right, and a black border around the outside. And then, you know, another, another aspect is, of course, that the cocoa runs at 5 volts, and the FPGA only likes 3.3, uh, so we have the level shifters. Uh, let's see here. So, back a couple, <laughs> years, yeah, back a couple years ago, this was how I, I probed. This is a 16K color base of cocoa 2. Not that it really matters, but... You know, here I've got basically a probe connected to the top at 6847, and then all my uh, probes run into my logic analyzer. Um, and so I have some traces of, uh, of, of the sort of data that I pulled off of this. So here's an example of um, a text mode capture. This is a short cycle capture. Uh, I set up VD here. It's probably a little bit of a eye chart. I'll just tell you what's here. So I set up uh, one of these rows to actually decode ASCII data. So this is eight bits worth of data. It decodes it into ASCII. Um, so what it actually says there as it's, uh, as it's reading, you know, so address, address zero shows up four cycles later. Uh, you sample the, sample the data line. So C, address one, four cycles later, sample the O, sample L, O, R, space, B, A, S, I, C, right? Just like it says up there. So <coughs> this, you know, waveform basically happens, you know, with uh, horizontal sinks on either end uh, 12 times for a, for a text screen because there's 12 rows of pixels per character. This will happen 12 times, and then you'll move on to the next row of characters. This will happen 12 times. This same, the same trace will happen. And then the uh, decoding for the ASCII, of course, happens in the 6847. So it, it knows what row it's on and, uh, and then therefore displays, you know, you know, the appropriate uh, combination, you know, mix of, of uh, green or black pixels. <clears throat> Let's see here. Yeah, so I guess I should mention that, you know, um, even though this was the first mode that I looked at, uh, you know, graphics data is generally simpler. You know, instead of having ASCII data here, you just have a, uh, you know, 8-bit bit field that represent either color or, you know, on or off uh, information about you know, a certain, a few, a handful of pixels that uh, the 6847 wants to output. So this was the, uh, the, the issue that I think, um, you know, there, there's actually websites that talk about it since then that uh, I was not aware of. But uh, what happens between, so this is a, a full row of data. So here's horizontal sync low, horizontal sync low. So this is a, a full, you know, full scan across the, across the top of the screen. Um, so you see here's address zero counts up to hex uh, 1 half, so 32, 32 characters across, and then um, the 6847 just keeps right on counting. You say, well, okay, that's fine, whatever, I can still sample that data. Well, only uh, address zero, the address zero line goes to the SAM. The SAM increments its own internal counters, so once the 6847 address rolls over, it's actually reading the next line, and the 6847 doesn't know it. So <clears throat> what this was causing was um, a shift in, uh, in pixels. You'd get, you'd get the next row of pixels partway through the line up to address 9. So uh, anyway, so, uh, so I, I, I made a, a simple fix to basically stop storage after, after the 6847 rolls over. But uh, anyway, and then going back to the, the long and short cycle stuff, this is a short cycle, like I said, it's, it's 4 o'clock. A long cycle the address stays on here for eight cycles, and then you expect to see the uh, the data eight cycles after the initial address change. Uh, let's see. So this is kind of the the general board architecture of, of how it's laid out. You've got the um, the PIA, and you know, these are basically the the mode mode bits that you poke either by using P mode or or pokes or what have you that set your your color state, your um, your graphics mode, and either alpha uh, alpha or graphics modes, right? Those go to the VDG. Um, you got the VDG requesting an address, and like I said, only address zero goes to the SAM. SAM provides a uh, full 16-bit um, address back to the RAM. 
RAM provides the data back. So basically what Coco VGA is doing is it's sitting and watching the data going into the VDG, it's watching the address coming out of the VDG, and of course watching the bullet bits, and then produces its own VGA video from that. Oh, and I guess I should also mention, hey, this kind of varies from, uh, from system to system, but uh, on the Coco pins uh, DD6, uh, data, data 6 uh, is connected to inverse and 7 is connected to alpha uh, versus semi-graphics. All right, and then this is the internal architecture of Coco VGA, so if you could kind of blow up what's inside the, uh, the FPGA itself. Uh, so here's all the signals that I'm snooping, right? Uh, the frame sync, horizontal sync, um, data address, the different mode bits, um, and basically the, the sync generator and um, you know, and the, and the clocks basically uh, tell the uh, state machine inside the uh, address data capture when to capture the data, and information about the frame sync lets lets it know whether it should write the frame buffer zero, or frame buffer one. Basically, this is a, a ping pong buffer system where the idea is that you write into the frame that you're not displaying, and you display from the from the frame you're not writing into, because otherwise you end up with tearing it, right? So uh, and then uh, those get dumped out to uh, the pixel gen module, and then that produces RGB. Pixel gen is the one that decodes, you know, depending on the mode, it says, oh, I need to produce a uh, uh, text, or I need to decode the, uh, the bits in there into color or uh, um, particular pixels. Um, so I think that's all I had. Uh, you know, thanks for attending. Uh, you know, it's only been a kind of a, a shallow, a very shallow dive. Uh, there's a lot, there's a lot more I could talk about, but uh, I don't want to take everybody's time. So, um, you know, just come by uh, my my table, or if you have some simple questions now, I'd be happy to take them. Uh, Boise, yeah. Uh, so the final product will be a snooper, or will it be a total replacement of the two? We'll probably start by making the snooper available, just because it'll it'll be available sooner. Okay. Um, you know, so folks with soldered. Uh, 6847s, we'll have to desolder and put in a socket. Yeah. Um, the good news is that you can put your 6847 right into this board, so you know you don't have to you don't have to piggyback on top of it, right? Do you have to make two variations of the board for the 6847 and the I believe so. Um, it's been a little while since I've looked at the pinouts, but I think they're different enough that we'll probably have to. But the advantage of the snooping too is that you'll use the RF can as well as the VGA. Can. Exactly. Okay. So um, I, they're they're. Ed is trying to talk me into the uh, the possibility of um, outputting the analog signal from the FPGA as well uh, with a replacement, but uh, I'm not keen on that. We'll have to see how things go. Cool. Thanks. How about that with the, uh, the ROM uh, uh, replacement for the character generator? So that's another thing that um, I mentioned to Ed, and I, you know, we actually talked about that a little bit. And um, uh, one one of the things we've discussed was was actually making the um, the boards field upgradable. If you have a byte blaster cable and you're willing to download Cordis and build your own Verilog and stuff like that, or, or I could I can provide images on my website or something like that, then people could could upload it and actually change their font sets, and then yeah, you could select between them. So that's an enhancement that we're considering. Yeah. Yeah. So sorry, you had a question. Um. I don't think so, but you know, now that you mentioned it, I guess that's something I should test. <laughs> I'll add that to my list. I'm glad you. Uh, I'm glad you asked that. So the Coco two that was the Opus five four nine seven seven zero was the twenty eight eight. Yeah, did you pick up the same reset? Yeah. 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 I'll have to give that a try. It's yeah. it's been a while. So your block diagram. There's, there's multiple reasons for that. One, the main reason is because I didn't want to have to probe the SAM and the VDG, right? right. Basically, the, the easiest place to probe the VDG is at the VDG socket, right? Yeah. Um, so that means you're going to have to snoop the SAM accesses that you want to implement the same graphics mode? Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing that, yeah, we may have problems with, uh, you know, SG12 and SG24 without, without knowing what the SAM is doing. Mm -hmm. So I think that's going to be an issue. Valid point. All right. Any
Any other questions? Thank you. There's a lot of very cool enhancements that we're talking about. Palette changes, uh, font changes, you know, put up, upload your own tile set to a RAM on the FPGA. Yeah, there's, there's a ton of them. So the hard part is getting it backward compatible first. <laughs> So that one can, could just as easily output HDMI or, or, or whatever else the, the FPGA board um, is generating. Well, sure. I mean, do, you, know, do, you, do you anticipate uh, doing something like that eventually with, with this? Possibly. Um, HDMI is actually something I considered early on. And um, when, I, when we thought about it, it was like, VGA well, is at this point kind of almost going away out. as well. Yeah, so that, that's something I'm considering. Um, the, uh, it was a, uh, now do I want to have to, you know, VGA is nice and simple. Uh, HDMI is, you know, a little bit, uh, yeah. a little bit more of the protocol, right? Yeah. So, um, but it's a pure digital signal. This is true. This is true. Yeah. So, uh, it's something we've considered. Okay. Um, I don't know how soon we'll, we'll get to it. I think it seems like VGA seems to be the, the largest, you know, yeah, you yeah, I, I, you can still find plenty of VGA monitors around. But that's going to change as now. opposed to the yes. trying to find a CM5 these days. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah. Uh, so no, no, that's something that we're considering. Okay. Don't know how soon, but we're considering it. Very slight. Moving we'll forward to ah. seeing the progress. Well, thank you. I hope it hope it goes reasonably. Do you know if Ed Snyder's coming? No. Yeah, I've, exactly. I've, I've bought several things from him. Uh, and uh, and worked with him briefly. Yeah, I'd like to do that. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
soldering. 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 Uh, soldering is something, it, uh, uh, across the pond, soldering is something you don't want to be caught doing. <laughs> One o'clock. One o'clock. Okay. We're gonna try to make it work. What heck? Not just the power plant. Right. Wow. 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 Wow.
Mike, is your plan to settle up at the very end? Or um, yeah, it? when I get some come up for air. After this, it'll be getting a lot easier, I think. Okay. But yeah. It's an auction. Stuff that'll go up on the auction. I think the auction is at two today or three? Three. Three? Yeah. Sure, last year or somewhere else? Last year, last year. Okay, now I came two years ago. Right. I think it was here two years ago. Yep, and it's been here two years too. I'm trying to remember when I first moved over here. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's not. Was it, was it in the hotel park? No. It was in the hotel when I came. It was in the hotel. It was in the same building. Uh, it was in the basement. Four years ago, we were at a hotel that was very close by. Up up near up near here? Near Elwood. Near Elwood. Near Elwood. Near Elwood. Yeah. Oh, Elwood and Elwood came out? Yeah. It's just um, like a block away from where the main was. It's the main road.
definitely more more people are selling more things this time next year. No, it was Coke though. It was Coke though. There was a, there was there was one speaker head to head. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This one this year seemed all the set up on there, but it was it was Coke though. Yeah, it was mostly Coke though.
That was awesome the video. I, mean, I now I understand what goes into that. You know why the die so is. I didn't know that a die would be that involved. Yeah. I thought it was a laser that did this. <laughs> No, they're meant to be used uh, for many hundreds of thousands of impressions. So you have so it. They, Once um, it's made, it's made. Once it's made, it's made. That's awesome. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's really cool. I, I, yeah. just, I never, you know, I always like seeing this side of stuff. I do IT, you know, for a lot of different companies. And I always get the, my kid always says, because uh, I send it pictures. It can be from a place that makes Red Bull. Yeah. Or he says, it, your, your job is which is not my job, it's just where I end up, yeah. is like watching the show how it's made. Yeah, yeah. Battery yeah. factories with, with constant controls and, yeah. you know, all this other things, but I've never seen a big printing facility. So. That's sort of the, uh, as you can tell, that was the uh, sort of, uh, um, you know, the theme that I was trying to do. I was trying to do a How It's Made yeah. video. And yeah. I love watching it. Yeah. yeah, I love that show. I mean, is that the company you work with a pretty good size, I imagine, right? Yep, yeah, we're a pretty big sized uh, printing company in the Bay Area. There's, uh, uh, works out really well for me. <laughs> That's cool. It's amazing that you were able to do it there, too. Right? Yeah, yeah. They, um, and, I, you know, that was my first printing job that I've ever done. And I've, uh, I learned so much about my own business by doing a printing job through the plant. And I did it all above board. I didn't, I didn't steal anybody's time. Um, and, uh, you know, it went into estimating, it went into sales, it went, in, it went into all the departments that I never even touched. I, I learned a whole lot about the very business I'm in by just getting something made. That's cool. Yeah, it really was. Took, took your hobby and, and learned from it. Yeah. More so than just what you made. Yeah. It's awesome. Yep. And it's neat that you have something at the end of the day that, you know, you fold, put together, and glue. And I'm still eyeballing those. I'm just, uh, <laughs> There's a couple of them left. I'll grab some more. Oh, cool. So, I figure the more I get, yeah, they're gonna support each other, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In my bag. Yeah. So, like, myself, I think I'll still have to fold this. Hey, Brett. How are you? No idea. Not working for you? Uh, I have no idea. Nothing's working. Drive wire's not working. SDC is not working. That works, but drive wire doesn't. Oh, I'm sorry. 
weird. You know, like how does this work for years and years? And it knows you. Uh, it knows you need it to work. <laughs> I do all emulator anyway, mostly, but I used to run down rail. Yeah, it doesn't even go basic. It doesn't even pull up this. It's basic. Yeah, not much could go wrong with that. But, all right, the CPU is working. The CPU is working, right? Most likely uh, the RAM's working. Right. I'm guessing. Everything's hotter than usual. It's warm. Nothing smoking. Sounds good. It's just one of those little bowl things I've got next to the cake. Hello, Jim, Tony. You surprised me. Why? Getting a hold of Marty. It's all location. Location, location, location. So are you selling t-shirts? Sorry? Are you selling t-shirts? No. Okay. Because you were standing next to a t-shirt. I thought maybe. Uh, <laughs> he might be. Who's he? Um, yeah, I'd say with all of them that he's here, it's really good. Who do I have here? I want to buy a t-shirt. That's a what's a happy, but it's not the exhibitor. Uh, the t-shirts are twenty dollars. Right. 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 Excellent. I have twenty dollars for him. <laughs> How many viewers you're getting, Steve? Um, I, I lost track. We were up somewhere around a dozen at one point in time. We had Fedor Stamen and Simon Jonasson were on. Oh, uh, excellent. Right around the time you were doing your stuff and you showed the Marty clip and everything. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah. My thing says I have eight people watching. Okay. Well, I'm like off the air right now. I'm troubleshooting. Nobody said anything in the comments. It's really weird. Yeah. Well, yeah, we were getting some towards the end. People were saying, can you move the microphone? It's blocking the, the screen. And <laughs> can, you, can you get better zoom or focus? So. Complaining, complaining, complaining. Yeah, right? Yeah. 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 Thank you. 
Because they've been going for so long, there's probably. I think I'm going to just go ahead and bring it in here and set up for everybody. Yeah, yeah. Right. We got two so people in the event. The last one that we're going to send you to the event. So, check all the time. Are you Alright. Right. 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 Right.
probably uh, yeah, give me a number. Rich? Hello. What? Do you know how many people we've got registered so far? Uh, no. I can tell you in about three minutes. This is for a jam that's right, Mr. Chicago. Tell me who's the opening. Who's the opening? Yeah. Here's your backup singer. Check one, two, check. Can everybody hear me? That's pretty good. Three birds. Check, check. You got Freddie in there? I got what? You got Freddie in there? Who's Freddie? Freddie Fender. <laughs> No, Jim is. Oh, nice. I hope he does. No, I just put this in here because everybody's having a hard time hearing people. We'll see that it'll be on. I brought it along. So that since he was uh, fire number one of the adapter and that he wanted to be, now the payback is. He has to sing for his son. Sing. Yeah. Are you going to come back to the room or because I got you a orange juice and water? Yeah. 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 That better last you at least five minutes, Mark. What's that? That better last you at least five minutes. Yeah. We got an hour. I told him he only has an hour. <laughs> Mark has a tendency to talk. <laughs> How about we, so people don't think this is part of the auction? So. I'll clean it up. Okay, good. Take a deep breath. I can help. You want me to help? No, I need the on belt. I know. That is true. What, what's he got now? Would, would you believe me if I told you I brought a little bit of everything? <laughs> no. This is a normal day right here. Mm -hmm. Mark is the only person I know who brings one of everything from his table for a seminar. Actually, I haven't even brought that yet. I'm going to go get that. You've you got the seminar stuff is still in the truck. <laughs> right? Oh, this is it. It was in the bag, so I think I have everything. Is that a heat thing for the printer? I think I have everything. Everything is working, which is amazing. It'll go to hell when I jump out of the power plant. Mm -hmm. Uh, break only in case of emergency. <laughs> oh. Get these out. Uh -oh. That one's good. This one's dying to work all the time. With our stuff. This one's a little one. I'll just show this one. There you go. This is you gotta use the interesting uh, one. Octopus stuff. Mm hmm.
Yes, sir. Who's going to be here in the morning? Because here's my dilemma. I have a video. My laptop, what are the inputs on this projector? Do you want me to be Um. My, my laptop only outputs HDMI. I'm wondering if there's S video in, audio out. Will this, will this, is this, is this kind of like a shared, is this a shared video, a projector for us all to use, or is this something? It's, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Somebody brought it, I think it was Brett. So I'm just wondering if I, if I upload my video to YouTube and I can use somebody else's up. I have like a five minute video to show us how I record my YouTube videos. So, but I wanted to play that video on the screen and I can't play it from the laptop. Well, I have the VGA adapter to my iPad and I have the YouTube app. Okay. So if I had good connectivity, Mr. Twilight himself. hearing from my lawyer about my missing apostrophe. <laughs> hey, Tim. Yes. Uh, they were telling me, did you, those uh, Coco SD, I got a couple Coco SD cases, those were from you, huh? The clear ones? The clear ones. Yeah, those I were made, really nice. Yeah, I made those. Yeah, yeah I'm seeing them out there. Oh, I got two no. of them. Yeah, those two yeah, do you have any, uh, have any more? No, no. I did the, I bought a, uh, you know, four by eight sheet of plastic. And I had to had 116 oh. top and bottom plates made, oh. and uh, went through them fairly quickly. And oh, yeah. no now John Strong's doing really he's doing really good cases. Oh, is, he doing, is he doing cases for them? Yes, he oh, is. Out to grab up the head oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, know, dude, I like your cases. Those were nice cases. Well, you know, I stole that idea. Did you? Yeah. There's a there's a 
There's a company out there that makes these things called Sick of Beige. Yeah. Because they were sick of the beige cases that they would get at the electronics store. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so they just created the system of top and bottom uh, plexiglass glass plates with all different sizes. Okay. And uh, so, yeah, that's, what I, that's where I stole that from. I could not believe it when you showed that video of the production for those cases. That's crazy. You mean the box video? The box video. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, it, like it's all the work involved fun. in that. Yeah, I've I've been in printing a long time, and that was the first time I ever actually paid for a job. Like did your own yeah, did design. My own, yeah, but I, you know had to go through the sales department, the estimating department, all these all these so parts. So you got of to things. see yeah, from start to finish yeah. what's involved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were blown away back there. Like, you know, your boys and I were sitting. There, <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll be posting it to YouTube soon, so everybody cool, can yeah. enjoy it. Yeah, I'll, I'll be, be posting that. it to YouTube soon, so everybody can enjoy my box video. Well, <laughs> Give that another watch for sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, also, Marty's video I'll put online so uh, everybody can see it. Is this your donation? It's no, another, it's I, a, no, it must be another set. That's another set. We, those are ones we got yeah. from VCF, isn't it? Yeah, same same ones? Yeah. No, no, we got from here. Last year? Last year. Oh, okay. thinking of uh -huh. it's supporting USA because not all source China yeah so I didn't cool. get, yeah a lot of people get their uh, stuff yeah. printed in China yeah I thought I thought of that. I was watching all that production I'm like that's good to see I, yeah. I got some quotes from some Chinese companies as I was talking about in the, pre in the presentation but they just did not understand you know I, I sent them a complete die line that was professional quality and ready to go and they still screwed it up when they sent me back the proofs but I, you know, I'd rather pay more yeah. and get them done here. Yeah. Because it's you know, yeah. There's a lot what, of that's what we, gotta do. we gotta help each other out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like I'll, I'm gonna buy some modules before. Uh, oh yeah, know, yeah. Remind me. No, oh, no problem. Yeah. I'll we'll save you some. Awesome. <laughs> I recognize your face, but I can't put a name to you. Jim, Jim, are you warmed up? How much warm up do you need? Actually, it looks like the drive through mounting didn't line up with the holes. Okay. Uh -oh. How do you choose the topics you uh, do on your YouTube channel? <laughs> <laughs> How does that process go? Like, hmm, I need a video out today. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. It's uh, uh, need content. You gotta, you gotta make something come up. Occasionally, something comes up. Oh, there's the odd point of the line on the road that actually yeah. reflects the 
headlights or something. Good one, Mark. You expect a lot of drive time thing. Probably at uh, some point after I actually write it. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you feel working on there for two years now? <laughs> yeah. I, it's just been a running gag. Oh. Yeah, I started writing a C compiler uh, you know, oh. about uh, five years ago. And, uh, From scratch? Yeah. I got a, I've got a, a preprocessor that works, and that's as far as I got. Right, right. <laughs> and you were working on your own operating system. Yeah, I've been you know. working on that for 20 years. <laughs> See, the thing is, uh, Nitrous 9 is about as close as you can get with OS 9 to Unix-like already. Uh, just because of the way it, the, the commands and modules and everything is all conflated together, you can't get more Unix-like without completely redoing the user space on it. Uh, so at that, I mean, point, at that point, you're pretty much uh, rewriting it from scratch anyway. Uh, but uh, the basics of how it handles switching from Instruction pattern wasn't getting used before. <laughs> so, uh, one thing I wanted to ask you is you're, you have a familiarity with the fuzzy code base, probably a little? Absolutely. Uh, and 
as far as actually getting into build ones. And you're probably familiar with that C light compiler that uh, uh, has been released. That's what yeah, that, that's what his name is. Yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't remember his name either. Do you think there's any chance of getting Fuzzix compiled with that C light compiler? Likely not until it gets uh, a little fuller language coverage. Because according to his notes, his main, the big parts that he's missing is, is floating point and bit field operations. The floating point isn't going to be a limitation for for the Fuzzix stuff. At least the, the kernel. Side. The kernel shouldn't be using floating point. Yeah. Um, the uh, bit field thing may or may not be an issue, but getting bit fields right is nearly impossible, and almost nothing uses it. Okay. Uh, you're better off to you know use a, a byte field and input those bits directly, because yeah. uh, there's some unfortunate semantics. The C spec wants for bit fields; they are very unfortunate. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you can have a signed one bit bit field. How does that work? <laughs> 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 But what does it even mean? You know. Yeah. Uh, I think it's. I think it just gets treated as unsigned by most compilers when you do that. And implementation. Uh, yeah, I think yeah, it's probably one of those implementation defined things. Yeah. yeah. Uh, which means it couldn't do anything from formatting your hard drive to actually doing something useful. Coming up with new answers in Yeah. Yeah. You know, it just spit out forty two. Yeah. 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 Forty two in one bit. I think, I think it might have issues. I don't think it supports 32-bit uh, types either, like long. Yeah. And I think that is where the oh. kernel might run into trouble because some things like block addressing on uh, hard drives and stuff probably need a 32-bit value. So, uh, so if, they're, if they're not already using a structure with two 16-bit values and fudging it, uh, then uh, that could be a limitation. And that's actually harder to solve than it sounds. It's not like the code to do the operations on 32-bit values is pretty easy with the 6809, but uh, you, you, you'd need, you would need something, I think, to handle those 32-bit values. Uh, yeah. Either as native long, yeah. or language. Because uh, GCC 6809 does support them, yeah. and uh, it does use some encoding on it. Well, you want to if it's going to go wrong, you might as well go wrong big time, eh? <laughs> stuff said in the uh, machine description, it will split it and do it in a in chaining operation. Yeah, well, I, 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 I'm sure. Or, or well, yeah, it does, yeah. but uh, yeah. most compilers, you need to can the instruction sequence and just feed that to it. Uh, and, uh, GCC 69 can actually chain the operation for multiplication and division, uh, which means you don't have to build a separate uh, support routine for a 32-bit division routine or something like that. Uh, may or may not be beneficial. Uh, it'd be faster to can the 32-bit division routine, of course, but uh, it's it's actually it's getting smarter yeah, too. I've noticed. Uh, the 4.6 generates better code than 4.3. Can I talk to Lynn about testing that? Yeah. Okay. What about this one? So you uh, you have reports it generates assembly lines and it generates. Did you make any changes to LW tools to uh, support GCC 6809? I did uh, mostly for the syntax that was already spitting out. Yeah, I, I really yeah, I put, I put really it on charge and it did get it working together. I came back I too much and it was ringing. I, I, 
self-contained and not have to try to you know, put that <laughs> together. And also I, I did it with an eye to supporting a robot uh, as well. How are you? Uh, so I, uh, and, and, you know, the talking to Mark here. He called the nine. object format that it uses, which is custom because the existing object formats don't allow complex relationships. Oh, okay. Uh, where you've got two unknowns in the... Uh, oh, okay. Format. I wonder where it's at. And then the linker evaluates the expression. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. And there's a yeah, it's going well. Yeah, it's going well. Two unknowns in the operand. So, what average thing was we talking about there? Well, say you've got a. Uh, I am. I'm turning. There's a lag. There's a pretty good lag. Uh, referencing two symbols. Yep. Mm -hmm. And if those if yeah, I'm waving. Those symbols is local to the file. Oh, okay. <laughs> But yeah, I got to finish that up here. I'm going to add one more portion of this so I can get back. So yes, sir. Yeah. 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 Right. You don't know about the value. And the assembler doesn't know the value of either one of them. Okay. So now you've got two unknowns and have to go in the object file along with the operation. Okay. So and actually, that's actually the object file along with the operation. Okay. So and I also needed that yep. support. I will. I will make. I'll, I'll make sure of that. Uh, relative branches. All right. Inside the. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, sections. Yep. Um, you can sort of fake it with a single relocation capability, but uh, I found it. I was building an object file from scratch. So I might as well just do what's going to be useful. And the funny thing is, the linker, I bodged it together in about 16 hours, spent another eight hours debugging it, and that's basically the state it's in now. <laughs> up over time, but not much. Uh, I'm amazed that like, it, it hasn't needed a lot, which is also why it doesn't give some useful diagnostic messages in, in certain error conditions. Uh, the error message in some of the conditions is segmentation false. <laughs> which is obviously not useful. <laughs> well, that's the OS tell you your program crash. Now, I remember a long time ago, um, I had posted Unraveled uh, source code for Carl Basic yeah. and text file that was assembly assemblyable by Mahmood. And I, I remember reading a message from you saying that, oh, you, you, you took that, reworked it for LWASM, and it took a really long time to assemble. Do you remember that? Yes. You remember that was going uh, and the reason it took a really long time is because uh, the, uh, the LWASM. Try to pick the shortest addressing mode on a forward reference. Uh, so if you've got the PCR nonsense in there, uh, it will actually use an 8 bit offset on a forward reference. Uh, unfortunately, the way it does that is a bunch of algebra and equation solving. And as you accumulate a whole bunch of instructions where it doesn't know the length of them, that just makes those take longer and longer and longer to evaluate. And it makes, uh, and I think at the end of dump its uh, intermediate stuff and uh, it had an expression, the last expression for the line address uh, after the first pass had uh, 4,000 unknowns in it. <laughs> so, uh, I, but then in the color basic thing, 
almost nothing is going to improve on a forward reference, so I have a frag number to turn that off. <laughs> so, and then as soon as it does that, it takes twice as long as Mandy did, which is, you know, a quarter second. <laughs> Well, that'd be things like uh, I lost my power, my battery, and my laptop needs to be replaced. Everything went down. Uh, so those would be uh, something. <laughs> I had it all verified. Like the, way, the way DriveWire 4 implements them, there's a, a race the condition works. that's impossible to avoid. Uh, you can actually lose data or freeze all the ports yeah. until one to one jams. Another day. Maybe you're replacing uh, you know, raw network packets, say PCP packets down the wire or something like that. Uh, it, that also works out a way that can send a variable length packet to the COCO uh, with, in that with just a 16 bit length and then the, the data following it. Do you have a delay after the length? Nope. Doesn't need a delay after the length. So it just works. It's magic. Uh, but I had to unroll the loop for those first two bytes to the length, and then, and then uh, do the rest of it. Uh, that's the only way there was enough uh, CPU cycles to deal with all of that. The, the, the four instructions, I had to deal with the, the, the length to uh, fit them all in there. You got another Well, I need to know how many bytes are coming in so I know when to stop receiving bytes. Right, uh, and uh, I needed to keep it uh, simple so it'll work off any serial port, right, not, mm -hmm. and not require capability to signal things like breaks. Yeah, yeah. Not all of them do that properly. Yeah, it's, it's too bad because that's in the protocol uh, for RS-232. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that does take some reading to and simplify the drive wire. Well, well, a break is, is just a, a really long zero. separate the actual low-level port communication so that uh, 
but so I've got the protocol working on standard input, standard output, and I've got a shim that sets up a serial port for the clock or uh, because there's, there's nothing out there that already does that. Maybe you could use a standard INET D or something like that to do the, uh, to let it run for any of So what's on the Coco side, what's your test bed? Uh, and that's working. And that, and I'm not that working. Kind of a small world. Yeah, it's running on Lens right now. It should run on the network right now. It's free to the system. I don't think I've done anything crazy. It might need something Certainly work. It should should at least work on the uh, if you're using a TCP type connection to it or something like that. Uh, the serial port stuff you might need to modify the shim depending on what the operating system needs. Uh, which is the other reason I want to keep the, the shim to set the two communications ports separate because that varies system to system. But the protocol is going to be. We're just going to go with that. That that there were there's some problems. We're not going to comment about the little squiggles it's on the left hand working. side. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> See them all here. Something I could run a command line that connects to the disk image, like connects the disk image I'm working on to the serial port uh, without having a massive uh, GUI thing and I need Java and everything working and, and deal with the bugs in the JV. Well, it's it's uh, part of the problem is Aaron ended up using a native library to deal with the serial ports, and that is the entire problem with almost all of Aaron has because he has to ship uh, basically a shared object to every client. But there's also a, 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 his, his thing also has a bit that uh, calls out to a web browser if you want to help it out or whatever. And uh, that part, there are bugs in various JVM implementations that actually cause it to crash and you get a backtrace in the Yeah. Uh, so you actually have to disable that, that probing for a browser pin in the JVM, launch DriveWire, and then you can set the JVM back to normal, and then it works. It's, it's really annoying. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's, that's the other reason. I his, his, his original DriveWire port server was great, it's pretty clean and small, and except for the serial port library. It could basically work nicely, and then he went off the rails with his original Yeah, because you're clobbering the signs in that way. If you overflow it, it's going to clobber. 
Robert was trying to Actually, all of the left ones, uh, the roll and the shifts, set the okay. game. Okay. 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 As you would expect, based on the carry from bit six to bit seven. Going the other way, I think it specifies as undefined. I think it does set it usefully as to I'll just have to pop out. Yeah. Uh, if yeah. you actually check yeah. out the start of one extra line. Yeah. So uh, maybe that 6x09 document uh, actually okay. just checks that. I'm not sure. I don't think so. Went through and did a complete instruction set reference. Was 68 or 9 and 63 on the And uh, did it very, in a similar style to the, uh, to the 11th ball reference check. Yeah, with the same types of charts and everything. And it's a really good reference and it, and it actually has tested instructions I used for the 63 or 9 stuff. When he was doing that, I remember he said he found some errors in his possible accurate documentation at the time. Uh, he also tested what the various undefined operation codes do on the 6809, and he documented some of that in there, like what, what the 6809 does for undefined operation and a transfer instruction. For, and the 6309 and undefined operation instruction in most cases. It does a different thing on the transfers because all the bit patterns are defined, right? It, uh, you can actually detect which CPU you've got by doing a, an undefined exchange or something like that. Because one of them will give you a zero, zeros in your destination, the other will give you all the ones in your destination. So let's just put those tickets over here. I know there's some stuff Mess wasn't doing right with with the uh, interrupt vectors and stuff for a while back. Uh, that got fixed. Uh, I think you might have been in on that one, that discussion when we were trying to figure out how do we prove it? <laughs> because everyone was saying, well, T Bolt says this. Well, T Bolt was wrong. <laughs> well, in this case, it was where does the Cocoa 3 get its vectors from? Turns out it gets from the top of the internal 32K wrong. But every every documentation out there said it got it from the top of the color basic area of the ROM, which it didn't. And uh, you know, I, I remember that it took me a while to figure out how I could prove that. Yeah, but it turns out you can prove it without doing that. But you can't do that. You can't do that. And that, that's due to, that's actually not due to the Gibby. That's due to the way the ROM chip itself is, is actually installed on the board. Well, it does that for the RAM, so you think you should be able to, so it should be able to for the ROM, but the way the ROM is on there, only the upper, only the, the select bit, only the select line is tied to the Gibby, instead of the upper two or three address lines as well. And that might have something to do with the way it works in the MMU is disabled and so on as well. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, you, you can move it. You can move it down to the bottom half, but it has to be in the same spot. Yep. Yeah. It, it stays. It's like ignores. Yeah, I wrote that up on the Coco Wiki when I discovered that. I, I well, I knew about that when I was testing for uh, what did the vectors do. So I knew I had to use the uh, six six zero 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 to seven F F F range to see what was in the ROM on those upper five twelve bytes. I remember why I I discovered it. I was writing a ROM number, and I I felt it would be easier just to dump the same four K, uh, the same eight K eight K four times. You know, it's a, a first session, and like I have it. 
which it would be if it were. Yeah. <laughs> I could have the same uh, secondary loop. Uh, but yeah, instead, yeah. what you really have to do is do a ROM RAM copy and use different blocks than the uh, normal ROM yeah. copies to, and then dump that. so much nicer if the animation just to juggle the ROM around. Juggle the ROM around yeah. But it's because the, 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 uh, the, turn the, the 7 the bits uh, for address 1 and address 2K internal ROM are brought directly on the bus. They, they don't transport through the GIMI selection or the... Uh, I checked the schematic and I wondered about that. Why is it that way? And that's the only reason it would be that way. Because if the GIMI determines what the ROM is enabled or not, and that's it. Right, they would have Yeah, and also, you'd have the same problem, how do you deal with that for the cartridge port for an external ROM? So they would have had to have extra hardware to handle that, and uh, I think that's why they didn't. And then they said, okay, we, we should probably just make all the ROMs behave the same. Uh, but you know, they could have done the banking on the 32K ROM in the cartridge port too, but it doesn't work there either. So I, I still have to get you a patch to LW Adam for uh, the, the the Leaco patch. I owe you that <coughs> for the car basic OE motor. Yes, yes, there is. Because there I'm sure that. somebody at some point. Someone's going to ask why it's not in there. <laughs> it's in the assembler, yeah. yeah. It's not the only one that's in there in the initial. I think there's another one that's in the assembler and not in the linker. But I think that one doesn't make sense to put in the linker. Yeah. I like completely. And really, it's almost identical code. So uh, for the other. Oh yeah, it will be. It'll it'll be. Yeah. yeah what? Well, just the, the that part of the linker is basically the same. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the only thing that's stopping me from writing it is I have to write two assembly files to assemble it, and then leave together to test it. Well, actually, you, you can just use one file. Well, I'd want to test it through the well, internet. Yeah. Yeah. Or is it well, you're not going to change the way you launch it. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. You're just, well, it's just the output. Like so so it's, it's already linked by the time it gets to the output. Because right. it does everything in memory and then dumps the output. Well, you're right. I, I don't have that. Yeah, so you could do, take any normal file and assemble it through an object. Yeah. And you should get something that at least you can check to see if it did something sensible. Yeah. Uh, I was kind of proud of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you want it to load in actual color basic, you have to get a decimal. It doesn't have that. Right. Right. That Plus, I could get more numbers on a line. Because there's more... Uh, okay. Well, no. Hex would on average hack better because you don't have any three digit numbers. <laughs> yeah, but uh, it does make the code for reading it more complex. Because you have to deal with strings now. Yeah, DMH. Yeah. Now, what if I wrote 8 bit character? That would fail because you don't use the DMH. Uh, right, and the quotation marks are handled specially yep. in data statements as well. Because uh, if you have a string with a comment, it's all going to float around in the data statements. So, uh, so you can't actually put a quote in a string in the data statements. And, uh, and comment is also an obvious thing. Did you manage to figure out why for uh, So what I could do is have a blocker binary 
Mark, do you want to use the amplification? It would be better uh, for my audio pickup. Do an Ozzy Osbourne concert thing too. First thing in a way. Test, test. Well, good afternoon. Um, to start the Cloud Nine seminar, basically uh, titled the final chapter. Question mark, of course. <laughs> Make it intriguing. Um, basically, going to go over uh, what I tried to accomplish this year. Um, wasn't one hundred percent successful. I um, I think I made great strides, but I didn't, of course, get where I wanted to be. Um, so with that. Uh, the biggest pro uh, project we had was uh, the Super the Spectral. Um, back in April of last year, Luis contacted me, and he said he is having some life changes, um, and he wanted to know if I would take over um, his version 2 project, of his RGB to VGA project. Um, I said, Ye I was interested in it, but there would have to be some changes because I didn't like the packaging, how everything went together. Um, so I kind of started the investigation and started looking into the project. Um, some of the features are listed here, which probably most everyone knows. It's basically the same as the DE0 um, current configuration, except this one just supports the COCO3 only. Um, with that, uh, this is the unit here. It's fairly compact. It's in this palm of your hand. Um, has basically the same features as the D0, except for um, the screensaver, which is a nice little twist that um, Luis did um, for Cloud9. Um, our current product here, um, this is a stuck board. As you can see, it's very, very compact. Um, this ain't working. So <laughs> this way. Uh, it's very, very compact. Um, there's 129 parts in the bill of materials for this, electrical and mechanical. Um, I don't know what the exact breakout electrical is, but there's a lot. There's 500 and 
19 pins of solder in this first run that I did. I did 34 boards, um, 18,000 solder joints, something like that. It's all hand placed. Um, work under a microscope to do this. I actually can put these together um, very qu fairly quickly. Um, probably hour and a half in one of these or less. I can do it. The mechanical aspects, the case, is where I need to do the some improvements. Uh, and there's a lot of time involved in the front and rear and bottom case um, and how that's manufactured. So on the next revision, I'll do some manufacturing um, process changes to allow this to be assembled easier on my part. Um, the overall look of it won't change. Um, one thing on the people that have purchased this, um, thank you. Um, a portion of each sale goes back to Louis um, to help in the future development of this product and support. Um, one of the issues that, that you'll see is the SVGA connector varies in size. And I've got kind of a tolerance issue on the back when you do the power in the VGA connector. Um, it's a tight. It's a tight fit. I didn't have a lot to work with um, in the back. So generally, as a rule, just plug the power in first and then put the VGA connector in. It'll go right in. If you try to do it the other way, you're, you're kind of shoehorning it. You feel like you're going to break something. So, But other than that, um, some of the key features. Here's some of the pictures, captions I have here on how I uh, conceive of a product, try to make it work, see if it's even going to fit um, into the case, uh, do parts selection, uh, do some mock-ups, and the one on the right, that's actually Mike Rowan's, thank you Mike for letting me use uh, your device in the development of this product. Um, that was actually um, Luis's, I don't know, how many nails did he sell, Mike? Two. two. So it's either serial number one or two. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's a great little device. It's used as a core four development board that you can buy off of eBay. Um, I didn't like the way the thing was packaged, of course. Um, so I ended up basically doing my own core four or cyclone four layout of the FPGA on my own board here. And just various pictures. And that's the screensaver on bottom metal of something Louis surprised me with one day. So it's kind of cool. Uh, again, various pictures um, of the device. And most of these are on Facebook. Posted them on the Coco list, but people that can't see them here online. The nightmare bottom. I mean, the thing is, I need a CNC machine. <laughs> it's all hand handmade. Um, a lot of time. There's about an hour in the front faceplate panel. Um, all the holes need to be um, punched. I use a punch, not a drill. So I punch each one of them. Um, just taking the nuts off the switches is enough to drive anybody crazy. And then putting them all back on it. So <laughs> I'll be working on some improvements there. Uh, the brick. I made, like I said, I made 34 in the initial run. Um, I had 26 good units on the first run. Had some manufacturing defects. I ended up fixing all of them except two. This is one here that's bad, and it's on the JTAG chain not being identified. So I'll look into it a little bit more. I made 50 cables on the right. They're all custom as well to get the right twist to come out and up into the bottom of the unit with the proper clearance. Um, that's another issue. The bottom of the board actually sits in the unit to get the right clearance on the, on the bottom of the unit um, for the connector, because there's very little feet access here. It's actually canted. It's actually tipped up slightly, a tenth of an inch. Um, so you get the perfect connection on the bottom. Just more. I don't like production. <laughs> I like doing engineering stuff, but uh, these are just different steps of the process of the build um, where I'm 
during the process of it. The dreaded front panel assembly process. Different screenshots. Um, I'm going to try and do this. It's very risky. <laughs> I'm going to um, switch over and actually show some live demos here on the machine itself of the real product for the people online. so far. Um, again, that's a screen saver. You want to plug the video? I got to plug the video in here. Start out with this screen. It's kind of one that I like to play around and test with. It has various modes. It supports the artifacting, like I said, just like all the other ones. So you can turn the artifacting on, and then you can do the phase. Select here. It has a scan line mode as well, you can see, um, just different modes of it, a uh, good one here is, it's one of the colors here, Richard Boken, I can probably all pronounce his name right. Richard Gokinen or something like that. Guy that made one of the game um, uh, engines uh, created this program. Uh, it works really well. I mean, there's some cool features in it. You can do uh, this color set, and then you can go to solid colors, uh, red, green, blue. Go to lines. You can select different line patterns with different colors, um, etc. So that's one of the test programs I use in checking this out. Um, this is the final one that I, I run. This is um, Getting some, getting some lines on this adapter, but this is what you do to tune it out. Um, I don't have a manual written for it yet, but basically you, there's two buttons on the side, an increment and a decrement button. Um, you squeeze it, it starts flashing fast, and then it goes into a blink mode. It means you're in programming mode of a digital pot. There's a Atmel um, AT168 in this one. Um, that controls the digital potentiometer, so you don't have to open it up and tweak each one. So, I mean, I can sit and adjust. Each monitor is a little different, so once you get it set up. Um, and then you press the two buttons at the same time again, and it writes it. It's stored. You don't have to do that again. It's an E squared. Next time you power it up, it'll return the net stored value. If you hold the two buttons for 10 seconds, it returns to a factory default, so it'll just go to my midpoint settings. Usually, usually the yellow black and the white black lines give you the most, I call it anti-aliasing, you'll get some herring going, going on in it, so. Uh, and then of course the uh, the ball demo, the bouncing ball, I could load it up, but everybody's seen that. Another sock master uh, creation that I use. So. Okay. I've covered a lot of that uh, stuff already. Uh, the firmware development platform that I'm on, I'm on a, um, a compiler that I use. It's uh, called Bascom. It's kind of like a Visual Basic uh, type uh, compiler for the uh, AVRs. 
um, which I have here on uh, this screen, or not this screen, on this development board. It's a SDK 500, this is actually live, so you can see the heartbeat LED, um, and you'll see the, you can see through the case, I don't know if you guys can see that back there, you got a red blinking light, it's a little bit brighter than I wanted it, but um, that's the heartbeat, and then the other one here on the, on the, on the, is the power LED. So I develop all the firmware on this platform, and it's almost perfect when you recompile and put it into the, the board. I get the two switches here. Goes into programming, goes into programming mode just like it, it would. So um, here's my digital screwdriver I'm hanging there. So um, some of the, the screen stuff that you'll see, Got to switch in between live. Mark, you want to check? No, I'm just I'm going to reset it right now. Um, this is a debug monitor but, uh, that I wrote. And now it looks like the font's messed up, but. Uh, <laughs> I know you guys can read that back there, but what it's doing is it's doing an E-squared dump of the memory that I'm using, um, and I can check to make sure the settings are right, what versions I'm running, um, where the set point is, the game um, of the pod, et cetera. So just a tool that I use. I have that on all my products, so it runs off the serial port on, on the devices. Next problematic design we had was I'm working with uh, Bluetooth and I'm running with a microchip. It's an RN42 device. This is it right here. Um, it, this one actually gets soldered to the PCB board. Uh, the one I really work with, it's a development card. It actually has legs on it and I can plug it into a XB shield um, and, and do development. I worked about two months trying to figure out what I was doing wrong and trying to get the keyboards um, to work, the mice to work on this device. And finally, you know, it's, I'm doing everything right. The manual says it should work. It's not working. I contacted tech support. We worked with them about two weeks at the initial level um, at Microchip, which now purchased Atmel. Uh, so they're one and the same. And stumped him, and he ended up taking the... Uh, uh, case up to the Bluetooth group, and the Bluetooth group had it for just a couple days, and it came back and said basically, yep, it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we got a firmware fix for that, um, and then we went through the process of um, getting a new device programmed, so I was supposed to have it, um, it's, now it's scheduled to show up Monday. <laughs> so, um, that was about three months of now wasted time, but uh, yeah, it's very very frustrating um, with that. Um, now this one here, it, the intention, the reason why I got different I got different Bluetooth demos that I'm going to show you here. Um, this one here, its intention is to go on the PS2 interface adapter that I have right now because I have some spare I/O that comes out to the SPI port on that device and I'm going to have this thing as a, on a board that allows us to plug this um, onto the PS2 adapter and then also this can be applied onto the super board um, which I'll get to later on here um, in the development of this. Bear with me here because I got a lot of little demos here. This demo up here. Let's go. Can. All right. 
reset it. And of course, you probably can't see that. <laughs> but basically, what happened here was um, I'm, I'm on the Arduino platform. Uh, we do a lot of development on the Arduinos or the SDK 500s. So this is a Mega 2560. Um, this is my Ethernet <coughs> one. The actual Bluetooth one's here in the back. And I have a, a, a Bluetooth shield that plugs into the Arduino with a Bluetooth dongle um, that plugs into it. So basically what it's saying is the library's been initialized, it did some resets, it found what, out what the Bluetooth Mac was, um, and now it's in discovery mode. It's asking me to do discovery. So I got a Logitech um, Bluetooth mouse here. So I'm going to just push the, the uh, discovery button. Push the discovery button. Live demos. Reset. All right, there we go. So it, it found the device. Now I start moving it. So do the scrolling, hit buttons left, right, position, uh, deltas. So far, and you can do it to, with a keyboard as well. Um, I'm, I'm running the Logitech keyboard. I'm not going to go through that here right now because there's a pairing when you start pairing. Um, so it works. It doesn't work. It's not as smooth as I'd like it to go yet, but uh, we're working on it. Once I get this working on the Arduino platform, um, then I move it over to the Bascom drivers. Um, basically, I'm not doing anything that someone else hasn't already done. Um, so I'm using the Arduino as baseline drivers to then implement in and write into the BASCOM. So. But it all works. I mean, Bluetooth keyboard type away, just like keys come flying up, up, down, it works. Bluetooth library is created by a gentleman in uh, Denmark, and I'm having some dongle issues. He, I think he's written it for a certain dongle. <laughs> so I bought seven of them, and none of them work um, for the next uh, portion of it, the, the demo here. So I'm going to just go with the wired version of it, which is... Um, I'll go, I'll go to the MP3 player first. Um, I spent some time on this. Um, there was a discussion on the list about sound generators and so forth, so I kind of started looking into what would be a, um, a, a solution, a, a good solution. I ended up settling on, currently, it's subject to change, but uh, the uh, VLSI um, 1053B chipset, um, I should have had a demo here. Um, I had some level conversion process. I was on a five volt platform. The device is a 3.3 device, 3.3 volt device. I was running way too fast for my converter circuit. So the SPI bus went south. So I had to relay everything out, go to a whole nother platform. And I just ran out of time with the problems I was having with the VGA converter. So I basically, this is already on the BASCOM platform. It can stream um, audio to uh, like a, a WizNet um, 250 device, which is basically this little tiny module up here at the top. And it can play um, the music in the background off of the uh, ATX Mega, which is the device that's going to be um, in the Superboard and the Super SD. Um, it's a 32 mega. Hertz uh, risk processor. So it's got a lot of horsepower, eight DMA channels on the device, SPI. It's a lot of horsepower. So just kind of cool feature and um, basically the interface into that would be uh, 
drive wire. Um, all the enhanced calls would be a drive wire based protocol to set up streaming, set up all the sound blasting at intervals. If you want a certain beat at a certain interval, you can set all that up through the timers and so forth of the device. Graphic equalizer, everything. Uh, USB host. That was another one I'm playing with. Uh, that's a Max chipset. Um, again, I'm on the Arduino. I never really messed much with the Arduino IDE. It has some nice features, but it's so slow. Um, watching all the C compiling that goes on in the GCC and all that stuff, it's just. It's, it's amazing how much processing power it takes to generate 11K of code um, in the end. But it works, it's a great platform. Um, Bascom, I can do the same, same compile, which takes about two minutes. I can do about four seconds on, on that platform. You can turn things very quickly. Um, I already did the HID mouse. So I'm gonna demo the uh, PS3. Um, Neil, I, we talk to Neil, Neil, we talk, but we don't talk. So we got projects and we don't really know what everybody's working on. So not stepping on any toes or want to step on toes, but uh, I have this PS3, so <laughs> PlayStation controller. And the intent was to be Bluetooth wireless um, on this, which is not quite working yet, but uh, we're, we're working on that. Um, so I'm, I'm wired right now, basically I'm tethered um, into it. So let me find out which one that one's on. Basically, just say the PS3 USB library has started. Um, I'm going to turn the hit the PlayStation button. Just it responded saying I hit the PS button, um, and now it's alive. So I'm going to do the different buttons. There's so many darn buttons. I'm not a gamer, <coughs> so this is really foreign to me. <laughs> but uh, all the buttons are, uh, you know, registered and reported here. You got the top hat controls, 256. Which one? What's that connected to? It's actually connected to a USB host right now. And it's reporting all the information um, via a serial port back to just a terminal window. What type of hardware is that? You know, USB host could be anything. What type of hardware platform does that control? Just on a, on a MAX 3. 3421E. It's on the Arduino. No, I plugged in. You got the triggers as well. So I'm pressing the right one. 0, 255. Left. Switches. I think I'll do everything. I'm supposed to be doing Bluetooth right now, wireless, but not quite there yet. Which, which Arduino is that? 2560 Mega. Yep. The uh, Arduino Leonardo has USB capabilities built into it, some of it. So. Host? Um, the internet well, can be a device. Being a host is a whole different story. This is definitely true, yeah. yes. So um, that's where we're at with that. Um, so no offense, Neil, I don't mean to step on any of your toes on any of the development. you got a great device. Um, but it was something I've been working on a long time, too. So. <laughs> you know, and the, pl the plan here is this will be this will be either hooked up into the Super Board or the Super SD, and again, it's all drive wire, so great protocol, Boise. Um, hats off, so flexible. If it isn't there, make the protocol that you want it to be. Um, so there'll be no conversions. Uh, hopefully, some new games will be written towards this platform. 
Um, oh, I'm going to show you one more thing, which is even very cool. So you've got a shield plug in on top of the 2560 that's acting as a USB host. Yes. Here's a pitch and roll. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> so this is cool. And it's got force feedback, too. So you turn on the force feedback. But, uh, again, cool features. Uh, oh, and then back on the drive wire. So basically, the, what you're doing is you're freeing up the cocoa to do other things. So you're offloading all this conversion process, monitoring of the, this USB stream that's coming out of this device, and it's an EDR stream. So it's coming out at about a three megabit rate right now out of the controller. Why a joystick's got to do that, I don't know. <laughs> that's what it's doing. Um, so what that does is the Coco doesn't have to monitor any of this stuff. It just basically says, hey, I want to get a joystick value. What is it? I want to get a switch value. It just sends the drive wire call out to the X Mega, and the X Mega says, here it is. Sits in registers or locations um, on that device. So, so if, you, if you want to, let's say, have an action triggered when a particular joystick button is pressed, that means you've got a pull with those, basically. And, and again, the, the platform is interrupt driven. So um, we can set it up. It's all how you want to set up your device. And it's all, you can pull, which isn't very efficient. Or you can just say, hey, when you have something, let me know about it. And it's all in the, in the setup of the drive wire um, protocol. It's not to say that you have to pull a regular joystick on a Coco anyway and get the value. You do a lot more than pull it, actually. But. Yeah, and convert and do all kinds of things. All right. All right, and the ultimate goal was to this year have the super board um, done. I, like I said, I ran into chip problems, chip development. I couldn't get the chip set stabilized enough to move forward with a, with a stable product um, in the firmware development. Uh, so anyone that was here last year, this is basically the same mock-up. Um, the PS2 is probably... PS2 is going to connect or it's going to go away anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be replaced with Bluetooth. So. In the USB host right now, that, then that shield is just a single port. It'll probably end up supporting two um, host um, ports on there. Um, a lot of the, the tools, I got a lot of time in development of um, Ethernet tools on, on this guy. Um, some of the, the calls that I have um, are shown up here, and I'm going to list every one. But uh, I got the no IP where you can have uh, DYDNS um, servers, you have dynamic addresses. I've got servers written that talk to those actual servers that report back who you are so you know where you're at. Um, uh, time protocol. What's my IP? And turn around and it'll it'll report that to you. Um, UDP is running, so you can you can actually send messages back and forth um, to yourself. Um, these are lower level utility subroutines. Um, your layer status. Um, everything on the on these devices is basically an INI file that sits on your SD card. It's just an ASCII file, and that's what the CF um, configuration read. Uh, routine does goes out and reads that whole file. Uh, basically, on the uh, virtual ROM, you know what do you want to be when you boot? You know what ROM do you want to be when it, when it boots up? That's stored in that file. Free sockets, um, daylight savings time, silly stuff, but. All that stuff needs to be in there for proper time management. Um, send email. So you, you just do those calls there and just 
very easily send an email off. And the this is a tethered or this this platform I'm on is on a WISNET 5300 or W5300 platform, and it's a wired uh, protocol. Um, the final solution target is going to be this one, be the the Wi-Fi uh, WISNET um, 250 on there. Would the from function be the same address that's just listing from? Well, there's only seven, there's eight sockets on the device. You have to initialize it. And you, there's, you just can't do one function. There's a sequence of things you have to do to build um, the email up. Trust me, it works. So I'm just looking at the, <laughs> I believe it works. I'm just looking at the documentation. Hey, isn't there something missing from the doc code that's on the screen? But OK. one thing. Um, one of the changes that I'm always thinking, Sandy always tells me to stop it. Uh, enough's enough. Um, let it be done. Uh, <laughs> it's a hard thing for an engineer to do is to, to move on because I don't have a marketing guy cracking on my back. But uh, one of the things that came up to it, and, and I want to move forward on this, is um, to allow the external device or a super SD um, or even the onboard SD um, that's on the super board, um, allow it to do a DMA into the Coco's memory map. Um, the Coco is not set up to do DMA, so the gimme's in the way. So with that said, uh, it's basically a big mux and I control the gimme and what, whether or not, what time I want it, the, the bus to take over. But the, the premise of what it's gonna do is, um, through the drive wire protocol, you request a sector, you know, 512 bytes. Um, normally you poll it, you know, are you, are you there, are you there, are you there? And then you start, the cocoa starts transferring that block as fast as it can. Um, Theoretically, Boise and I have looked at that timing and the best approach in which calls to use, um, 6309, you know, transfer block moves, uh, which way works the best and is the fastest. And theoretically, we've computed that that time will be um, seven to nine seconds. Current TC3 um, SCSI host is the fastest device we have, which was about 10 to 11 seconds on a mega read. A uh, super IDE comes in about 20 to 21 seconds, um, just by the mechanisms and how it works. Um, with the enhanced DMA mode, you can run in a legacy mode and then let the Coco get one byte at a time, transfer, transfer. Or you can set it up to allow the um, X Mega to actually place it. And you just basically request a buffer, where is it located? and it is just put it in the Cocos memory map so the Coco doesn't really even have to transfer the 512 bytes anymore. It just appears. They're using that um, line, I forget what it's called, on the cartridge bus, mm -hmm. which probably states all of the, the CPU and everything. It's line B? Yeah. Um, that one I use to take other devices off the bus um, to get it. There's, you can, you can slend B, when you fire slend B, it doesn't even take the gimme offline. The gimme's hardwired in the middle between the CPU and the, and the memory. Um, I think you can still get to the 64K memory map though with, with SlimB, right? Well, SlimB takes everything off the bus, peripheral-wise, uh, in the cartridge right. area. So, um, so it doesn't try to stay to doesn't try to take this, doesn't try to say the CPU. There's advanced signaling that you have to know. It's VSBA when you start getting into the processor. When the when the processor actually is releasing the bus, you know, so I'm watching the bus states fetch, you know, what state of the instruction the processor is actually in. So that when the bus is released, then the X Mega switches the gimme out 
And then I take over the address bus and the data bus, and I start blasting uh, the data in, into the into the RAM. Uh, well, again, it's a, it's a the X mega. What you got to watch out for is the X mega is so fast. It's a 32 megahertz risk, so it does everything in one instruction. I think there's only a couple in one cycle. There's only a couple instructions that it doesn't do in one clock cycle. So I got 70 nanosecond RAMs, so I have to watch out that I'm not going too fast. Right. And I have to watch my weight states, stuff like that when I start writing um, into it. But um, there's areas, since I moved to the triad, um, if, which is SRAM, there is no refresh anymore. So it's dead time. The gimme thinks it's doing it. It's, it still thinks it's doing a refresh in vertical and in horizontal retrace. So those are free times um, in blanking, video blanking time, that you can just start blasting. So you can just start hammering in those periods, you know, every 16 milliseconds, 16.6 on the vertical and 15 whatever on the horizontal. So you can actually go in there and you can actually start bursting more cycles rather than just your CPU time when the screen's being displayed. So there's little areas where you can speed up and slow down. So and again, it's all signaling control, um, which, which is done in the uh, LTR devices. Um, I believe that's everything I have. Um, I didn't show my little MP3 development board, but this is another shield. Um, that I use. They can just plug into it, hook up to the Arduino, right to drivers, basically. See how it performs. If it doesn't perform well enough, go get another chipset and start over. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm, I'm hoping that'll, that'll do, do well. I mean, I did a, uh, a stream in John's and Neil's podcast, that uh, three and a half, four hour marath marathon one. Um, did as fast as the uh, the uh, X Mega could do. It still took it 20 minutes. I was reading the file as fast as I could and jamming it out to the MP3 with no sync. Just I wanted to see how fast it could go. It still took it 20 minutes. And that what 105 105 meg file or however big it was is monstrous. So okay, with that said, any questions? Uh, you want to see the stuff run more live over there? I'm surprised it didn't blow up on me. Usually something goes haywire. I, I read something that you can support um, something like 512 colors with your converter. Yeah, it's, it's all Luis's core. Um, and it's basically an 8-bit conversion on a red, green, blue. So um, 8 to the third. But the chip side doesn't support No, that. no. But it, it's the the board is he, he is doing that conversion, so he's got a fine granular step. The cocoa's got a coarse step, so even though it's stepping at bigger steps, he's looking at a finer grain when he starts you know digitizing the analog signal. So, and I verified that with him. I wanted to be sure, and he said, "Yes, it is." You know, doesn't mean you're getting 512 it colors. Like, as it goes into a pixel, it comes out of pixel. Can actually you have a little bit of you know, you know, fuzziness actually mm -hmm. from the Coco's original analog signal that you still pick up on the. Yep. Mm -hmm. Nothing's perfect, and um, I detected a few things today. Um, I really pushed hard to get this device out um, to get it here um, for the fest. So, seeing a little waviness that I don't like that I didn't see in the lab. Um, I don't know if that's the every monitor is a little different. Everybody's power is a little different, but. I'll be looking into it. So you gotta look, gotta look to see it. But if you didn't tell some people, they probably would never see it. But I noticed, I noticed on your board you didn't populate the um, JPEG port. No. It's a, it's a, if you're going to come out with any upgrades, because obviously I have bought one, and if you come out with upgrade, upgrades, you're going to supply the. Here's the trick. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. All you do is to take your 10 pin IDC, yeah. and you stick it, you stick the stakes. In, yeah. and you just stick them in the holes and yeah, it's tight enough to. You just put it in and lean it to the side. Program. 
So I don't need to. I don't. I don't want to add another and solder some more devices that I don't have to. So even though it's in perspective, ten pins. Right. Out of five hundred and eighteen. <laughs> it's only a couple seconds to go down it, but. I just have the pin stakes in my uh, programmers. And I just put them in, tip them to the side, hit program. Um, there's two programming buses on the uh, on that board. There's an Altera and an Atmel, and um, of course they're not the same. So you got to have two different programmers. And I actually program both of them at the same time. Good, because right, yeah, I got the Altera one. That that should no problem. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, Byte Blaster program right in. Yep. So if there's any updates, it'll be distributed, um, you know, through the website. So um, that's another thing on the on the super board. I spent a fair amount of time, and the people that were here last year knew of that. Um, it's such a versatile, you'll never get the firmware right. Um, so there'll always be updates or additions, feature ads, whatever. Um, I have an, a, an encrypted bootloader. The, the device supports AES-128. It's got a crypto engine built right into the device. So I set my key, my private key, compile it. I can put the actual firmware up on the website. You guys download it, put it on your SD card, plug it into the unit, and it'll bootstrap right up in there. You'll get a firmware update and just by plugging it in. So. It's a, a, a way of distributing, uh, you know, fixes, enhancement features, whatever, without having to send it in. Because I don't know, post. I hope nobody works for the post office, but holy moly, it costs a lot of money to ship stuff around these days. So, so if I put the firm, the, the pins in that socket, does that void my warranty? Nope. <laughs> what warranty? <laughs> 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 With that, that concludes her. So thank you. So, if you know what's out there, you'll have an idea of what you might want to bid on, hold your money back for what you want, and if I don't bring it up, you bring it up and say, well, what about that over there? So, oh, I'll go over there, follow your direction. Familiarize yourself, please. Mike. I'm not here to out people. <laughs> but why not? The shade of their. Uh... They'd be like, uh oh, there's Brett. Wait a minute. Yeah. He's half naked. Yeah. <laughs> well, um. I have a smoke. Embarrass myself in front of you.
find somewhere where you feel like a table or yeah, okay. <sighs> yeah. Giving other people a chance to see what's going on. So here's Gary Becker. How are you? I just need to know when it turned on. Everybody says fine. <laughs> Gary's here showing off his Coco 3 FPGA. Yes. Let's take a close look at that. I'm running the uh, demo specifically done for this Coco Fest, the 25th annual last Coco Fest. It's running uh, 640 by 480 mode, 256 colors. It's 288k of memory to hold that whole screen. Right. Right. Unfortunately, my Coco Three. And then it's also interfaced to the joystick. And it runs at this speed normally. If you move this joystick over, it speeds up quite a bit. So, who's the line drawing machine are you using? Uh, Dave Phillipson actually wrote this whole program for me. Phillips. Phillipson. Speaking of VCR. Here's the board. The DD1. Very nice analog, analog board is built in there. It has a two joystick um, interfaces, yeah, a serial port, uh, four additional megs of RAM, and then there's an add-on Wi-Fi module and real-time clock. Battery backed up, I assume. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's a little coin cell battery on the bottom side of that module. What's that little? Maybe that's what you're looking for. Yeah, yeah. That little things. blue module sticking out. This one? Yeah. It's a, underneath? You know, this, yeah, this is the real time clock. Okay, that would be it. Right. Yeah, it's got a little coin show battery on the bottom side of that. So, uh, what have you programmed the DE1 buttons to do? If yeah, this one use is the uh, speed. It goes up to 25 megahertz. If you're running, you're, we're running at 25 megahertz now, but if you flip this down, it goes back down to the uh, 1.89 megahertz standard cocoa speed. These two right in here are uh, substitutes for the multi-pack interface switch select. Um, some of these other ones do various things like swap the joystick ports from left to right, right to left. Uh, and then these next to the last two here are the uh, drive wire uh, baud rate. I've got it set for 460k baud rate right now. And then this last switch here uh, switches between the built-in serial port and this external serial port. I can swap back and forth between those. How much are yours? 40 for for yes, These four buttons right in here, yeah. there's a reset button, and then uh, because this thing uses a PST keyboard, and when it comes up, it's not capable of doing the, uh, you know, the, uh, the keys for doing the Easter egg. So I'll go ahead, if you hit this and do that, then the Easter egg will pop up. Yeah. And then I also have control for the delete for the reset. Uh, yeah, you're right. You're right. Okay. Yeah. I gave you 40. Unless it's in standard basic. I don't think it is. No, no P mode. I think one way or another you're getting That's just interesting. You see, even, even at this slow speed, when you move this over, it, gets, it goes back up to a pretty normal speed. Uh, it runs good. Uh, it runs good at the, on 25 megahertz mode. I bet. All right, let's see what else we have. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. 
here we're at the Cloud9 booth. Say hi. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. 